Okay. So, if you recall last time, any other questions? Yes. Uh, well, everybody turned them in like the last day or two, and so hopefully the TA is starting to work on uh, the grader is starting to work, and hopefully we'll get them back by the end of the week or early next week. If you have any questions about any of that, you know, feel free to come to office hours or or send email or something like that. Okay, so if you recall, there are five different categories of iterators: input iterators, output iterators, forward iterators, bidirectional iterators, and random access iterators. But rather than just rattling those things off, having no idea what they mean, we're going to go through each of them one at a time, and I'll show you examples of, of what they do and how they work. So an input iterator is commonly used when you need to read a value from a sequence. It's used to read from something and, and get access to the value. So you're, it's a read-only kind of thing. The other things that you can do with an input iterator is increment them by one to keep going forward. Um, you cannot go backwards, though. So here are some of the operations you can do. You can have the copy constructor and assignment operator for the iterator. You can do comparison to see if you're, they're equal or, or not equal, which is used for, for terminating when you're done. And then you can also have subscripting to read something. And you can have const read and non-const read. They're both doing the same thing, really. Um, and you can do both prefix and postfix plus plus. Those are the main things to do. So they're real simple. Let's take a look at an example to illustrate this stuff. So here's sort of a common way of using something that reads from some place. We're going to read from standard input. And you can see here what we do is we make something called an iStream iterator, which is actually an iterator adapter. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. But the iterator adapter is used to take something like an input stream or an iStream that's not an iterator and make it work like an iterator. So what we do is we assign the, uh, the iStream iterator adapter, the input stream. And then while we haven't reached the end, while there's something that's still left here, we're going to go ahead and put the element. We're going to read from that, that iterator. We're going to read from the iterator and stick its value at the end of the vector. Now notice in this case, we're using pushback. If you recall from our discussion a little earlier, pushback will grow the vector if it needs to in order to insert the element in there. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. That's a great question. So iterators have to be able to have ways of comparing themselves with each other. And now uh, we could actually take a look at this code in a minute, and you'll see how it works. So when you have an, an iStream iterator that actually has a stream it's iterating over, and that stream is not yet done, that returns non-zero. So the iStream underneath that keeps track of all this stuff is non-null. By creating this, this funky anonymous object, that's what this thing is right here. That's this mysteriously strange looking object. is actually an anonymous object of type iStream iterator. And that anonymous object has an iStream that's null. And when we finally have read the last item in the stream, when it reaches the end of the stream and it's, it's done, like you type control D or control Z or whatever you need to do to get things done on a stream, uh, in that particular case, that will return 0 as well. So at that point, the iterator we've been reading from will return 0. The anonymous iterator, which is on the right-hand side of this thing, always returns 0 because it's null. And then null will equal null, and we know we're finished and we'll drop out. So that's what that's, that's doing in that particular case. This is creating an anonymous object that has a null iStream. Whereas the first part, the iStream iterator i, starts out with a non-null iStream called cn. And we keep reading from that one thing at a time until we're finished. That's what that's doing. It would be, except that's not what's happening. So, so where, where are you concerned? Are you concerned with this particular thing here? Yeah. yeah. So unless you have a C++ compiler written by orcs or something like that, you know, <laughs> using dull pieces of metal forged in, the, in Mount Doom or something like that, <laughs> then it's going to recognize that, that this constructor always returns a constant value. And it does constant elimination. And so it just turns it into a comparison with, with null. That is a good question. In older compilers, 
might not have done that. If you were to have the misfortune of, uh, you know, going being a bad person in life, and when you die, you go to purgatory, and they make you program in old versions of C++ compilers, how would you solve this particular problem? How would you solve that problem? If, if you had a compiler where that was a problem. There is, but the easier way to do it would just be to create a temporary outside the loop called end or something like that, and then just pass that in. Because that's what the that's what the optimizer is doing. It's just it's basically doing constant hoisting. It's hoisting that thing out of the loop so it doesn't construct it every time. Yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? What's the difference then in comparing that? Because then you say it's null, but whenever you compare it, which song? Yes. So what's the difference in doing this and just comparing it to zero? Um, because the fact that it compares to null is an implementation decision of how the particular version of STL works. And we don't want to expose that implementation detail up to the application programmer. They shouldn't be aware of that. Okay. You'll see a lot of those kinds of things in STL. They, they, they hide things behind syntactic sugar to give you commonality of programming. And you'll see an example here in a second. OK, so every time through, we increment this by 1. And then we go ahead and we insert this into the vector at the end. OK, now, having said all that, of course, no self-respecting C++ STL programmer would ever write code like this. They would always write code like this, which is identical to this code, but it's much more cool because it uses STL features and uh, adapters and iterator adapters and all kinds of other interesting cool things. And it also uses STL algorithms. So let's go ahead and take a look at this particular code. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and stick it into Visual Studio so I can actually show you what's going on under the hood. All right, so let's format this thing a little bit more sensibly. OK. So what this code is doing, well, actually, what this code is always doing, let's go take a look at copy. It's always so great. It gives you like 18 different choices for these things. There it is. OK, so this is actually the implementation. When you see this code here, copy, it's actually calling this. And it, it, as you can see, it's ridiculously simple, right? It's starting at the beginning of the range, going to the end of the range. Every time through, it's taking the iterator one at a time, dereferencing it, because of course it's an input iterator, so you can read it. And it's storing it into another iterator. This, by the way, is an output iterator. We'll come to that later. Ignore that just for the second. <clears throat> so it's reading this thing every time, and it's putting it someplace. And then it increments these things by, by one. right? So the question is, how on earth are we going to be able to get an input stream and a vector to be able to work in the context of this generic copy algorithm? This generic copy algorithm is meant to work with everything under the sun. But IO streams, input streams, output streams don't have those right, they don't, have, they don't behave like that. And vectors don't behave like that either. Well, STL comes to the rescue by using adapters. The adapter is yet another gang of four pattern. If you watch the videos I posted on Piazza in your spare time, uh, or we'll just wait till we cover it in class, you'll learn that the adapter pattern is a pattern that allows things to work together that weren't initially intended to work together. I think I have enough time to tell you the adapter pattern story. So, uh, anybody here ever traveled to other countries or come from other countries? So you all know when you travel overseas, you usually, unless you're very lucky, I think you could, like if you go to the Cayman Islands, maybe uh, you're lucky. If you go to anywhere else, England, France, Germany, China, uh, Russia, and you want to plug in your computer, you're not just going to be able to plug it into the wall directly. And that's because they have a different form factor for, for wall sockets. So what do you do? Do you go out and buy a special computer for every country? Of course not. You go out and you buy an adapter. It's a little piece of hardware that plugs things together. And it allows things to work together that weren't designed to work together. So my laptop was not designed to work with the British 
wall socket form factor, but with a, with a British adapter, it works just, just fine. So when I was uh, first a professor at Washington University almost 20 years ago, I had a grad student named Tim. And Tim, like most grad students, was short on cash, and he was living on hand-me-downs from his, his friends and relatives. So in his office, he brought a stereo system. But keep in mind, this was sort of you know, 20 years ago. It was kind of the early, mid-90s. And so Tim had a, a stereo system that was his brother's, which was probably from the mid-80s or so. And it had a cassette player. It had an amplifier, a tuner, and speakers. But it had no CD player. Now, you know, imagine what life was like when we only had CDs, right? How, how broke and how old. But it didn't have a CD player. But luckily, someone had given him a CD player for birthday, like one of those those portable CD players, and he wanted to be able to play his CDs through his stereo in his office. So how could he do it? Well, if he'd had plenty of money, he would have gone out and bought a, a new stereo system, but he didn't have the money. So he wanted to find a way to adapt his CD player to his, to his, uh, his tape deck. Well, as luck would have it, they actually sell or sold cassette to CD adapters. And it looked like a little cassette, and you could plug the cassette into the cassette player and a cord came out, and you could plug that into your CD player so you could play your CDs to your cassette player, which is pretty cool, right? It would even have that authentic hiss, which is so cool. <laughs> you guys probably don't know what authentic hiss is in the context of, of cassette tapes. So I started thinking, wow, if I'd had that when I was in grad school, I could have taken the 8-track tape player I had, and I could have bought a cassette to 8-track adapter, and then I could use my cassette to CD adapter, and I could have played the CD player through my 8-track, right? <laughs> now, I just have to tell you, there are certain types of music that actually sound better on 8-track tape. Any 1970s-era disco music sounds way better on 8-track tape. I don't know why, but it just sounds better. The point is that that's what the adapter's about. And so what we're seeing here is some adapters that allow us to take stuff like I.O. streams and vectors that don't know anything about iterator models and iterator patterns and iterator operations and make them work like iterators. So let's first take a look at the input iterators, because that's kind of what we're focusing on here. So here's the input iterator for this. And this will answer the question we talked about a little bit ago. If you take a look up here, here is iStream iterator constructor that doesn't take any parameters at all. That's the second parameter we're passing to copy, right? So that's the one that's right here. That's this guy. If you go look up here, oops, you see there's iStream iterator. And you can see, as I just said, that sets the underlying iStream pointer to null, to zero. Implementation detail, but that's what it works. Here's the other constructor. Check out the other constructor. The other constructor, which, as you can see here, is the first constructor, takes the standard input, and it goes ahead and assigns the input stream to a local variable that actually keeps track of it as a pointer. So it has a pointer to something that actually holds real values, we hope, and the other one points to null. And then it calls getval. And under the hood, let's take a look and see what getval does. Here's getval. Getval says, if this iStream pointer is not null, then go ahead and try to read the next item and store it into this value. And we'll cache it away so we can use it elsewhere when we're doing other parts of the operations here. So that's what the constructor does. It, it goes ahead and initializes and holds onto this thing. OK, so now you kind of maybe hopefully understand what's going on here, where we're going to make ourselves an anonymous iStream iterator object that's going to be constructed with an iStream. And then we create one that's null. And then if we go back and look at copy, we notice that we have to check to see if we're done, if first not equal to last. So let's go take a look over here, and let's look for those operations. So here is the equal operation. And you can imagine that not equal in, in the equal operator call this equal method. And you can see what it does is it checks to see whether my iStream is equal to the other guy's iStream. Or my iStream. My iStream equals the other guy's my iStream. Well, the other guy's my iStream is null. And so the only way mine is going to be equal is if I've reached the end of the input and my iStream is also null. So that's how we compare whether things are equal or not. So now we kind of know how we get to the equal part of the loop. And here's where things get really fun. So if you go look at the copy algorithm, you'll see that what it's going to do is it's going to read this guy. And it's going to go ahead and it's going to store him into the output iterator. So we're going to read from this iterator. And we're going to store it into that iterator. We'll talk about that iterator in a second. So if we pop back up here, 
we will see things like operator plus plus simply does a get val, increments it by one, and returns a reference. That's the that's the pre-increment. Here's the post-increment. As we talked about before, notice how post-increment always has a little bit more work to do than pre-increment because of the semantics of pre-increment versus post-increment. What does pre-increment return to you? The incremented value. What does post-increment return to you? The previous value before it was incremented. So you can see there's a little bit more work. And that's why we always try to do plus plus iterator, not iterator plus plus. And then here's operator star. And you can see what operator star does in this particular case is it simply goes ahead and returns the underlying value. And so that is going to be used here, whoops, where here is there, to get the value that this thing is pointed to. And that's going to go get stored into this so-called output iterator. Now, I'm not going to talk about the ad output iterator yet because we are going to talk about that next. But I just want to kind of give you a feel for what's going on so far. So any questions? What we're doing is we're using the copy algorithm and we're using adapters to make iStreams and vectors, and we'll talk about vectors in a second, conform to the interface and the semantics expected by the copy algorithm. And the way we do that is by using iterators. I'm sorry, using adapters. So isn't this so cool? We've got the adapter pattern going on here. We've got the iterator pattern going on here. We'll see a bunch of other patterns come along. And we're not even out of, you know, we're still in generic programming land. We haven't even gotten into object-oriented programming. Demonstrating the generality of patterns as a multi-paradigm model for design. Yes? Yeah. So what's preventing that increment, like that plus plus, from like plus plusing itself into oblivion? <laughs> because you, you don't plus plus when you compare equal. So uh, very, spe very specifically, to, to answer your very specific question, go look at the specific piece of code. This piece of code right here, first not equal to last. When that is true, when first, you know, or when, sorry, when it's false, when, when first is equal to last and it's false, it drops out of the loop. And that's how we keep from incrementing ourselves into oblivion, because it'll stop when it reaches the end. Good question. Other questions? OK. So those are sort of input iterators. Let's now go look at output iterators. So output iterators are kind of the opposite of input iterators. If input iterators are good for reading from stuff, that gives you a hint that an output iterator is good for writing to stuff. So once again, there are certain operations. You can construct them. You can assign them. You can plus plus them. You can compare them for equality and inequality. And you can also assign to them. But you can't read from them. You can only assign to them. So here's an example. Uh, so here's an example where we're going to create ourselves a uh, file. And we're going to read from the file. And every time through, we're going to write the output of each element in the file to the standard output. That's kind of the idea here, right? And here's how we would do this in STL. You can go ahead and create an iStream iterator, that can give it a file name, and it'll read from the beginning of the file to the end of the file. And we can go ahead and write that thing to the output iterator, which has been adapted for standard out. Now I'm going to go back to my example and show you a couple examples of output iterators in the context of all this stuff. The first place I'm going to show you an output iterator is the third parameter to copy. The third parameter to copy, STL copy, is an output iterator. And that means it must be capable of being assigned to. So let's stop and think about this for a second. We've got ourselves a vector, which we did not give a size to initially. So we don't know. It has no initial size. Moreover, since we don't know how big the input stream is, we couldn't possibly have created the size in advance. We just don't have any idea what it's going to be. So we, we err on the, the side of uh, minimalism, and we give it nothing to begin with. So how are you going to add things to it? Well, keep two things in mind. First, we have to find some way to be able to add something to this every time through. And we also have to make it conform to this code here. It's got to be something that has got output, iterator, syntax, and semantics. You have to be able to use the star operator to assign to it. Any questions? So what we're going to do is we're going to use another type of adapter. This is an iterator adapter that takes a container 
in this case a vector, but it could be other types of containers like a deck and so on. And it does what's so-called back inserter adaptation to it. So let's go take a look at back inserter. Back inserter is a really cool function. So let's go take a look at back inserter. Back inserter has got this magic property because it's a function. And in C++, functions can do type deduction of their template parameters. So if you take a look at the call to back inserter over here, go take a look here. See back inserter. That's just a regular old function. It doesn't say back inserter int or anything like that. It just says back inserter. And then we go and we look inside here to look at back inserter. And back inserter is a template function that takes a reference to a container. And what it does is it creates an anonymous object of type back insert iterator passing in a, a pointer, I think it is. No, I take it back. Passing in a reference to the container that was passed in. And then back inserter returns that anonymous object by value. Totally and completely insane, right? Yeah. Wait, so if we can do type identification like that, why don't we just do the, the type identification for our classes? Like we, we say array of jars yeah. and it just does it. Absolutely great question. The question is why is type identification or so-called type deduction not done for your classes? Why do you why do you uh, only get to do it for functions? In C++, they only do type deduction, which is the fancy name for what this is, on functions. If you have classes that you're defining objects of, or structs that you're defining objects of that are templates, you have to explicitly give it the parameters. So type deduction is only done on functions based on its, the, the parameters. And there's a, a bunch of good type system reasons why that's done that way, but that, that's the rule. So what we're doing here is we're using back inserter, which does know how to do type deduction, to create an anonymous instance of back insert iterator, and then we return that by value as the return value from back inserter. Now, I had been programming in C++ for a long time by the time I learned about STL. I never in a million years would have thought to do stuff like this. This is what generic programming is all about. It's extremely powerful, it's extremely concise, but when you first see it, you're just scratching your head because there are all these anonymous objects being created by value. But it gets even more interesting. So let's go ahead and take a look at back insert iterator. Back insert iterator is actually a struct. And here it is, back insert iterator, which is inherits from output iterator. And here's what it does. The constructor of back insert iterator goes ahead and takes the address of the container that's passed to it, and it stashes it away in a local data member. So when you call back inserter and you pass in vector here, when you do that, then that vector gets stashed away inside this anonymous instance of an object that, can, that, that then is going to get passed around by reference or by value all over the place in the rest of the way that things are processing on it. And of course, the compiler optimizes all this away, so there's really no overhead. Now, the most Interesting thing, the most important method by far in this whole thing is operator assignment. Here is where operator assignment gets used. Right here, we assign the right-hand side, which is an input iterator, and we call the assignment operator on the left-hand side, which is an output iterator. And if you were to follow the path down, you would see that the output iterator in this particular case is none other than the object returned from back inserter, and that particular object's assignment operator, when called, takes the pointer to the container that was stashed away in the constructor of this anonymous object, and it calls pushback on it and pushes the value at the end of whatever container this happens to be. So that's how we're going to be able to grow this thing transparently. We're calling pushback on it. And if you recall from our earlier discussions with vectors and decks and so on, Pushback knows how to make the container big enough to hold the next item at the end. So does that mean pushback also defines the, like, the O stream above? Um, like if you were trying to, if, if we had this in reverse, if we were reading from a vector and trying to write it out, would this also, would this approach also work? The O stream stuff doesn't have pushback, but it does something equivalent in the way it's implemented to do the same thing. So the back inserter works for containers and decks, but it doesn't work for or containers that don't have pushback to find on them. Yes, sir? Do we have a dereference operator 
Yes, you want to see what it looks like? This will blow your mind. This is great. So remember I told you the most important method here is operator assignment. All the other methods are no ops. So operator star, the dereference operator you were asking about, operator plus plus, both different types of operator plus plus, they do absolutely nothing except return either references or objects of the iterator by, by value or by reference. You never actually had to in certain situations where, where you have adapters that don't require them. But there's lots of other places where you do need to dereference them. So in order to be able to write generic code, right? remember that your, your uh, copy algorithm is meant to be used for anything that you want to be able to copy that will work, right? which could be regular, um, various kinds of iterators in various forms, iterator adapters, containers that have been adapted through iterator adapters, et cetera, et cetera. We need to be able to write that code like that, because there are situations where the output iterator, the destination, does have a de dereference that actually means something. Like if we were to pass in uh, a built-in type, like a, an array of ints, for example, then the star would have a very specific meaning. In the case of adapting the vector to work using an iterator adapter, as we've been doing here, pushback does it all. And that's done in the assignment operator. So everything else just has to be there as syntactic sugar to hold everything together. It's just glue that's keeping it syntactically the same, even though it is a no-op. It will get optimized away to nothing, of course. So that's the real genius of STL. In fact, that particular pattern of having stuff that appears to do something but actually does nothing is actually called the null object pattern. So there's actually a pattern called the null object pattern. And the purpose of the null object pattern, we'll talk about how this ties into your programming assignment in a second, is to make it possible to write code that will work the same whether something is going to do something or not. So in a sense, the dummy node that you guys are doing in the AQ and LQ is the null object pattern. And the reason we put it there is because it simplifies the common case where you're checking for an empty container. And by using a null object, using a, a sentinel value or a dummy node or so on, you don't have to have the checks for null because you'll never have to worry about it. You'll always find something there. You have to figure out a few other things, but, but you don't have to worry about that. So yeah, it's very cool. It's very syntactic, uh, syntactic glue to keep the whole thing together. Absolute genius. It's kind of like uh, people who are, who are great musicians. Their, their genius comes from knowing what not to play, right? Not how not to overdo it. Probably the same thing is true with great actors. Actually, I'll give you a good example. I was watching the snowboarding competition, the Olympics last night, and I'll tell you what. You know, no matter how jaded and cynical you get about opening ceremonies and you know international terror and evil empire when you start watching the people actually perform it gets pretty cool right it's like wow and i watched all the people go and um you know a lot of the people were really good a heck of a lot better than i could be but they get up there and they'd be like swaying back and forth and flapping their wings they look like the eagles when they score a touchdown you know they're going like this and then who was it was it jenny anderson who was the one who won the gold jamie Whoever the, whoever the U.S. Uh, woman won the gold, she just was like completely, it was, it was like she wasn't even working. She, she was so smooth, so steady, so minimalistic, right? It was just amazing. And that's the difference between the true expert and the people, that, that's the difference between the gold medalist and the person who finishes out of the medal competition, who, are, again, are way better than I'll ever be, but the true perfectionist just makes it look effortless, right? And the same thing is true about designing code. When you really get good, it's actually very minimalistic, and when you're not as good, you write a lot of code. You know, it's, it's like when you're trying to write a paper, and you're not quite sure, or you're trying to write an answer to a CS251 quiz, and you don't really know what you're talking about. So you write a really long answer, hoping that somewhere in there is the, is the right answer. But when you know it, it's just like a couple of lines, right? Just as a random example. Yeah? <laughs> OK. So any other questions about? about that stuff. So here's the cool thing about all this stuff. Once we've got these pieces here, then we can write code that looks kind of like this.
All right, let's see if that works. Oops, didn't like something. What didn't it like? Vector is not a member standard. That's because we need to include vector instead of deck. All right, what do you know? There you go. Here's the input. Let's give it 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And we get back 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. STL still works, or I can still program it, one of the two. And notice what I've done here is I've gone through, I've read from standard input until I reach the end. I've stuck every element into the end of the vector. And then I've gone from the beginning of the vector to the end of the vector. And every time through, I've written the output. And you'd asked the question before, what does that look like under the hood? Were we to go over here and go find the definition of this thing? Here's OStream iterator. There's the constructor. And if you take a look at OStream iterator operator assignment, which is kind of what you were asking about, here's what it does. It takes the value that's passed to it and it writes it to the output stream. And if the delimiter is not null, it writes the delimiter to the output stream as well. So it doesn't do pushback, but it takes the output and it puts it someplace. It puts it into the, the O stream that it's adapting. In this case, it's C out. OK, any questions about that? Yeah. Um, on Piazza, Will was talking about uh, using namespace standards. Uh -huh. Bad practice to contaminate the, is there any way sure. to use it without you know, being inherently bad? So the question is, uh, should you do using for namespace uh, standard, or should you not? I like to, I, I've always had the ability to withstand carpal tunnel syndrome. So typing extra characters has never been a problem for me. Some people don't like to type extra characters, so they don't have to. With modern IDEs, as long as you stick with the IDE, you typically just have to hover your mouse over top of the symbol, and it can figure out and tell you what's going on. So the need to fully qualify everything with STD colon colon blah blah is lessened. However, if you or an airplane and you don't have your IDE or you're using Emacs like I do or you have a printout or whatever, it could be confusing to look at a big piece of code that uses lots of stuff because you can't easily tell at a glance where does it come from. And that gets particularly problematic if you have classes or methods or things that have the same names in different contexts. So that's why I prefer to use the fully qualified stuff. Having said that though, you know, different people have different styles. We're not going to enforce any particular style here in this class as long as you're consistent. So the main thing to do is not to mix and match stuff unnecessarily. So it's, it's certainly possible to, to use stuff selectively, but I just find it, for me, it's more confusing. But that, that's my choice. Other people choose differently. OK, questions? All right. So that was input and output iterators, plus a really super cool example to illustrate how they work. Forward iterators, surprise, surprise, are basically input and output iterators put together. And the only real difference between a forward iterator and an input and output iterator is that you can read and write to them. So otherwise, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Here's a very, yes? Is that kind of like multiple inheritance? <laughs> is, it is conceptually like multiple inheritance in the sense that a forward iterator contains the properties of both input and output iterators. The actual way that these things are realized in, in STL is not through inheritance at all, but it's conceptually inheritance. So um, they, they come, you know, they take the, the properties of both parents and expose them through themselves. So yes, it's definitely the concept of inheritance, multiple inheritance. It's just not the C++ multiple inheritance feature. So as long as that distinction is clear, then it's, it's fine to say it's multiple inheritance. So it's multiple inheritance, it's just not, not multiple C++ inheritance. Here's a simple example that uses forward iterators. This is a replace function. You go from beginning to last. If the, the item that you're, you're trying to replace is found, you then go ahead and replace it. Right? So you need to be able to have a forward iterator that can, you can use to both read something and also write something. Here's a very simple example. We have a vector with uh, three elements in it, all starting out to be one. We push a seven to the end. And then we go and replace everything in 7, everything that's a 7 in this vector with a 1. And then we go ahead and make sure that we don't find 7, because we hopefully replaced it. 
So this is an example of using replace. So that's an input and an output iterator, using them together. Next form of iterator, probably the, the most common iterator in STL, the bidirectional iterator. So the bidirectional iterator allows you to be able to go forwards and backwards in the container, whereas a forward iterator can only go in the forward direction. What's the one most important thing to distinguish a forward iterator from a, or a bidirectional iterator from a forward iterator? But, but what's the, what's specifically, what is it? Minus. Operator minus minus. So operator minus minus both pre and post decrement would be defined. Mm -hmm. Most of the STL containers are bidirectional iterators. Here's a very simple example of doing bubble sort using bidirectional iterators. And as you can see, if you look carefully at the code, it only ever goes forwards and back, backwards by one. So you can basically bubble sort anything in STL that is at least a bidirectional iter iterator. And then the final form of iterator that STL supports is the so-called random access iterator. And a random access iterator basically gives you everything all the other iterators do. It inherits things, as Lawrence was saying. And it also then defines all the other funky um, point arithmetic operations, like plus equal, minus equal, plus minus, relational operators, subscript, subscript operators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a simple example. Actually, it's a somewhat convoluted example that illustrates the use of these random access iterators. You can see you can do stuff like plus equal to them, minus equal. You can do minus on them. You can check to see relationships between iterators, whether they're greater or less, and so on and so forth. So not actually a very interesting example, but just illustrating that pretty much everything you can do with pointer arithmetic, you can do with random access iterators. The two main things in STL that have random access iterators are vectors and decks. Everything else has bidirectional iterators except for forward lists, which only have forward iterators because they only go forward. OK. So as I think I mentioned a couple times before, the great thing about STL iterators is that once someone has taken the time to implement them, they're really easy to use, as evidenced by the fact that all the Built-in algorithms use them, as evidenced by the fact that, that all the code that we're writing uses them. We can use you know, all the stuff like standard equal and standard fill and standard copy and all this good stuff. So once you have iterators, life is good. However, they are somewhat tedious to implement. They're not hard to implement. They're just tedious to implement. You have to kind of sit down and think about a few things. Usually, it's pretty easy to figure out how to do you know, plus plus. But when you do your AQ, make sure you figure out how to wrap, because that's important. Um, likewise, it's, it's easy to typically do dereference. Pre-decrement and post-decrement, uh, plus plus, or you, know, you have to think about how that works, but it's not hard. The thing that typically throws people a little bit often is the equality and inequality operators. And the key thing to remember is you're not comparing the elements in, you're not comparing the elements in the container for equality. You're checking to see whether the iterators are equal or not. And the main reason you're doing this, ultimately, most of the time, is to figure out when you're done, when the iteration has to stop, so you don't keep going, iterating uh, past the end of the world. So when you do your implementation, those are the things to think about. If you spend time sitting down and thinking carefully about how your iterators work for the AQ, then everything else is really, really simple. If you don't get the iterators right, Nothing else is going to work at all. It'll be just complete mind-bogglingly strange, and you get seg faults and stuff. So make sure you think about that carefully. Make sure that you also think carefully about um, running Valgrind on your code. Also, make sure that you understand how Subversion works. We're still having a few people who are running into some rough patches with this. Um, Will posted something on the Piazza early on that explains how you can check to see what the TAs are seeing when they go to look at your code. Please make sure you do that. You know, no reason you should be losing points for, for silly things like that, right? I mean, some stuff is hard. Re having a, a bug or two and resize, that's not a problem. Not getting your subversion stuff to work, that's, that's not a good reason not to, to get full credit. So make sure you figure that out. You know, you've got plenty of help. You have the video on it. Come to Office Hour, send an email, post to Piazza. If you're having really weird problems, you know, come and see us. We'll, we'll get it figured out. 
There's some articles that you might want to take a look at talking about using and writing STL iterators that appear on, uh, online, and uh, hopefully you can take a look there. <clears throat> okay, what the heck, bad, oh, yeah, that's right. All right, so where we're headed now is generic algorithms, and I'll, I'll just kind of go over this uh, briefly because I don't want to get too far into it at the moment. Before I do that, though, any other questions about the programming assignment? Yes, sir. So the thing to do, let's let's go take a look. I'll tell you what, what I'll do. I'll I'll show you a portion of my solution for assignment number two, which has iterators in it. And that may help you out a little bit. All right. So here is my solution for assignment two, we're, we're going to cover this more later next time, but let's go down here and look at some of the stuff that's relevant for what you're doing. So this is, um, this is a non-const iterator for an array. It's called array iterator, rather unimaginatively named. That's just there so I can have a class to name, of course, where it gets used is up here. Oh, come on. I type, it gets typed def to be iterator. That's what you actually use in your code. But here's its implementation. And as you can see, it's got a, uh, a constructor that's used to make one. And it's a friend of the array class, so it can get access to the pieces internally. And then it's got all the funny operators. Operator star, operator plus plus, operator const star, operator minus minus, operator equality and inequality, et cetera. Those are what we had for the array iterator. And then down here, we had. The array that we were iterating over, and you might get a sense that's going to be set in the constructor, and the position of the iteration at any given point in time. And you would probably expect that for the array, that position would start at 0. For your AQ, where is that iterator going to start? Right. So it'll start ahead. But same basic idea. So let's go take a look at the implementation. So here's my .i file. Oh, well, first of all, here's how I create my iterator. So you can see when I say when somebody says you know array dot begin, I make a new array iterator passing in this array and zero because that's where I'm starting. I'm starting at location zero. Obviously, for AQ, you'd start at head, not zero, but same basic idea. Here is end. Let's go look at end. As you can see in this case, the end of this thing is going to be uh, make an iterator that has the array and the size. That's actually one past the end, but that's how end is defined as iterators. Okay. For your implementation, for AQ, if you use head for begin, what do you think you use for end? Well, depends how you have your, your dummy node. So, so yeah, it's it's some some something to do with tail, right? That that's giving you the bounds of these things. Yeah. Um, this has to do with the way in which C deals with templates. And so this is a template, and so we're extracting out a trait called iterator from inside a template. And in that context, you have to word, use the word type name in standard compliant C++ compilers, so it knows what follows is actually a type as opposed to some other um, type, <laughs> some other entity. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we push for using G++, because it enforces this better than Visual Studio does. People write a lot of sloppy code with Visual Studio, and it still works. Okay. So that's how we make ourselves the iterators. Here then is how we actually access elements. So operator star, as you can see here, when you want the next element, you know, when you dereference the iterator, it just takes the array underscore, which is our array class, and it uses operator subscript, which is the one that doesn't check the range, to go check what the value is at the current pause for position. 
So it's just saying, what's the current position? That's pretty straightforward. And then we have, oops, must have, at some point, must have come along and been fiddling around with this to show people how it works. So here's operator plus plus. It simply implements, uh, increments pause by one, and then returns this by reference. That's how pre-increment plus plus works. And here's post-increment plus plus, which makes an instance of array iterator, except the instance has the previous version of pause, and then plus plus is applied after that version is read. So that's, that's there now. Your implementation for AQ had better not look like this. If your implementation of AQ just blindly plus pluses itself into oblivion, something is going awry. And, and why is it going awry? Because it's not wrapping around, right? So your plus plus method should be using the increment method defined on AQ in order to make sure it wraps around properly at the right time. Did you have a question? Yeah, in the, the pre-increment method, why does it not work if you just did plus plus pause? Or, like, why do you have to do the... Here? Yeah, in that method. Why do you have to increment this and say that it's pause and then... Oh, the, don't, don't get distracted by the this arrow. That's just a way of being even more verbose. <laughs> Remember I told you I'm, I'm, I'm stealing myself like, like a kung fu artist standing in a block of ice for hours on end. I'm writing more more words, characters than I need to. There's no reason to put this arrow. That's just a personal style. I don't even know if I use that style anymore. When I did this code a long time ago, I did. As I get older, I worry more about carpal tunnel syndrome, I guess. <laughs> it's your question. OK, so, so that basically should give you a pretty good idea of where to start. Um, here's how we did the comparison for equality and inequality. As usual, we do inequality in terms of equality. And then we just check the pauses and the arrays or other things. OK, quiz on Wednesday. Cover everything we covered since last quiz. Hopefully, you'll get your programs. Number two back soon. Stop and get your quizzes at office hours so you know how you're doing. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask.